Okay, so in this video, I'm going to follow on from my last video looking at double slit interference to looking at diffraction gratings and also single slit interference. So to start with, these are the things I'm going to assume that you know from the previous material on progressive and stationary waves. So to get constructive superposition, we need the two progressive waves to meet in phase. To get destructive, they need to meet in antiphase. And if they're the same wavelength, frequency, speed, and amplitude, we're going to end up completely cancelling each other out if they're in antiphase. So very much like we dealt with stationary waves, similar conditions for making an interference happen. Okay, so. Diffraction gratings are essentially just a, like a, just get a piece of material and you cut lots of slits in it really close together. So it's, instead of just two slits, we have hundreds of slits often in a row with each other and that changes the interference pattern. So what you get is narrow fringes. So if you look back at the interference pattern for a double slit, these fringes were much wider and much fuzzier as well. So the fringes from a diffraction grating are much narrower and they're much sharper, so they're not as blurry at the edges, they're really sharp and crystal clear. And the other thing you'll notice is the regions of black where the destructive superposition occurred are much bigger. And if we map this on an intensity graph like we did with the double slit, again we can see the central one is the highest intensity because the most photons uh, go that way. And we've got these large gaps between them, and then we've got these spikes, and the spikes indicate it's a sharper Im image that we are forming there. So that's our diffraction grating pattern. So just like double slit, let's develop an equation to explain what happens to the pattern as we change various parameters. So we are going to make an assumption, just like we did last time, that all the light rays that produce the same order are approximately parallel to each other. And we can assume that because the distance between the slits and the screen is considerably bigger than the distance between adjacent slits. Okay, so having made that assumption, what we can do is if we look at this triangle up here on the top left, we can see that if we create this right angle triangle, from this point on, they will travel exactly the same distance to the first order maximum or the nth order maximum, whichever maximum we look at. So the path difference from this section is zero. They travel the same distance. So from this slit, we can see that it travels this distance longer than this slit does to produce the same order maximum. And if we're going to produce a maximum, this needs to be a multiple of the wavelength so that they are in phase with each other. So, if we're producing the first order maximum, this length here is one wavelength. If we're producing the nth order maximum, this is n lambda there. So, if this angle here is theta, and this distance here is the distance between adjacent slits, called d, then using trigonometry we know sine theta is n lambda over d, and we get d sine theta is equal to n lambda, which is also known as the diffraction rating equation. Okay, so that's how we derive the diffraction grating equation. So let's see how we can use this to model what we see when we use a diffraction grating. Okay, so we've got our equation right here. So we can see from the equation that we keep D and N the same. So we focus on maybe just the first order maximum and keep D the same. If you increase the wavelength, we're going to increase the angle of the first order from the zeroth or central maximum there. So we can see that a red light, if you put red monochromatic light through a diffraction grating, it would have the biggest angle to the central maximum. Or if you put violet light, which is the shortest wavelength, that means the first order and the zeroth order will have a smaller angle between them. Okay, so. This has an interesting effect when we put white light through a diffraction grating, and white light is made up of all the wavelengths of the spectrum. So for most of the fringes formed, what you notice is it's got violet on the side closest to the center, because violet has a smaller angle between the first and zero order there. And you see that for all of them here. 
and red light is on the outside because it's the longest wavelength so it has the biggest angle between the order and the zeroth order there and you can see that here and what we get is in between as the wavelength increases we get a full spectrum so that's on all of the outer ones until eventually what happens is when you get far enough away these they, they sort of collapse in on each other and you just get like a white haze because you get the first order, like the I don't know, fourth order and the fifth order merging together so you don't get a clear pattern anymore. But the really interesting one is this central one. And the central is given the classification n equals zero, which is why I call it the zeroth order. The first order n equals one. So for the center, n equals zero. So it doesn't matter what we do to the wavelength, sine theta is just gonna end up being equal to zero. So all of the wavelengths will have an angle of zero to the zeroth order, so it goes straight on. Which is why the central one is white, because it's still made up of all of the wavelengths that all go to the same place. So we get a white central maximum, and it would be brighter than all of the subsequent maxima as well, just like in every other scenario there. Okay, so that's with white light. So what we're going to do is look at some of the applications of a diffraction grating. So mostly they're used in a field called spectrometry, where we look at the different spectra and use them to determine what something is made of. And we do that in two different ways. One method we use absorption spectrum, where we look at the wavelengths absorbed by certain materials. And we also deal with emission spectrum, where we look at the wavelengths emitted by certain materials. So, how we actually determine this wavelength is we use a diffraction grating as a way to measure wavelengths. That's how we know where the black lines are here, or the coloured lines are here. So, let's investigate each of those a little bit more. So, an absorption spectrum is when we're trying to measure the composition of distant stars. So um, that's how we know what our sun is made of, for instance. So for stars, they're so hot, they glow what's called white hot, which means they emit all wavelengths of the spe like spectrum. So the, all the visible, they actually send out some UV and some infrared as well, but they emit every single wavelength of the visible spectrum from the star. So the sun itself has an atmosphere just like the Earth does. So whatever's in the atmosphere will absorb some of those wavelengths. So those of you who've looked at the quantum part of the course will know that different elements absorb very specific photon energies or very specific wavelengths. So when we look at these black lines, they tell us what is in the outer atmosphere of that star, because if we know what wavelengths have been absorbed, we know which element that corresponds to, because we've done the same tests here on Earth. So by looking at the missing wavelengths, we can identify, oh, this star's made of hydrogen and helium, uh, but it's dying because it's starting to produce some heavier elements, for example. So the other kind of spectrometry is called emission spectrometry. So here, we're not interested in the wavelengths absorbed, we're interested in the wavelengths that are emitted by certain elements. So you'd have seen this, it's called doing a flame test. So you heat the element you're interested in up to high temperature. So we're not talking to the same temperature of stars, so it glows white hot, we're just giving it enough heat energy that the electrons in whatever we're heating become excited. Because that's unstable, so when they de-excite, they're gonna emit characteristic photon energies or characteristic wavelengths depending on which element it is. So that's why different elements give off different colours because they have different electron energy levels inside the a structure of the atom and that's why you get the nice pretty colours when you do this. Um, so that you'll have seen before but both of these methods rely on diffraction gratings as a means to actually measure these wavelengths, so we know where they are in the spectrum. So, how can we actually do that with a diffraction grating? So what we've got here is a very typical interference pattern. So we've got a wavelength that we're interested in and we want to measure it using a diffraction grating. So we send it through a diffraction grating and get a pattern like this. So what we do is we need to make sure the wavelength we're interested in arrive perpendicular or normal to the diffraction grating. And then what we're gonna do is measure the angle between the zeroth order and the different orders. So we're gonna measure it from zero to one, zero to two, zero to three. 
And then effectively what we're going to do is we're going to plot a graph of sine theta against n. Because using our diffraction gradient equation, we know the gradient of that graph is the wavelength divided by the distance between adjacent slits. So if we find the gradient and times it by the slit separation, which we will know because we've picked our diffraction gradient, we can work out what the wavelength of our that we're interested in is. So we've measured the wavelength. So just a quick thing in terms of this, because this is one of the required practicals, it will be better if instead of measuring the angle between the 0 to 1, you measure the angle between 1 and 1, which is a bigger angle, and then divide by 2. Why? Measuring bigger things has a smaller percentage uncertainty, so that's always going to be better. And likewise, when you're finding the angle for n equals 2, you go between 2 and 2, and then you divide by 2 again giving you the angle for this between the second order and the zeroth order there. Okay, so that's how we can measure wavelength. Now I'm going to move on to look at single slit interference. So what we've got up here is essentially a comparison of what the different interference patterns look like with the same wavelength as we increase the number of slits. So we're going from here from two to seven slits there. So we're keeping the slit size the same, but just increasing the number of slits that we've got. And we can see how the pattern changes. So we get, as we'd expect, these fringes get narrower and sharper the more slits we have, so they're approaching a diffraction grating. But what we notice is when you really look at the pattern, there are missing orders. So for some reason, they disappear here and they disappear here. And the other thing you notice is when you compare it to the first the diffract so the interference pattern, sorry, when you use one slit with the same wavelength, but again, the slit the same size as it always has been, you find that the where they're missing here is where there is a minimum with the single slit minima. So essentially it must be something to do with a single slit that's causing these missing maxima or missing fringes here. So that's what we've got. So What's happening is when we use, say, two slits, the, you're getting interference from just each of the slits individually because they've both got two edges, so you can create diffraction and interference patterns. And what's happening is this single slit pattern is cancelling out parts of the multi-slit patterns here and here. So essentially it's getting rid of some of our fringes or some of our maxima. That's what's going on there. So you'll very see, often see the, the diffraction grating, or the double slits, enclosed with what's called the single slit envelope. So if we look at our double slit here, the blue dotted line is where your single slit interference pattern is, and then the red is where your double slit is. So you can see that this is where your missing order is, where the single slit is at its minimum, and exactly the same with our um, single, single slit envelope for our diffraction rating, we get nothing here because it's cancelled each other out. So that's the single slit envelope. But it doesn't matter, like as in it's the same essentially as like your sink with your double slit or your diffraction rating with a single slit, you still get a brightest central fringe. So that's why this envelope is nice and big and you can see the envelope decreases in size the further away we get. So that's still the same for your single slit pattern, um, but it encloses both your double and your diffraction grating interference pattern intensities, which is quite interesting. Okay, so then let's look at what an interference pattern looks like with just a single slit. So what we get is something a little bit different. So before we're used to getting all the fringes the same size, but what you find with a double, uh, sorry, a single slit is the central one is double the width of all of the others because this process is working a little differently. It's not like from two different slits interfering, it's like from the same slit interfering with itself that's causing this. So that's why we get a different pattern. And we can see here, we've got very, very wide fringes, so very little spacing in between them. So we've got a double width central fringe and the central fringe, unlike the others, is massively more intense than the others. So before, there was like a decrease. Here, it's bright, nothing. So actually, it's often very hard to see this interference pattern. Now, what you find is there's this relationship here. So W in this equation stands for the width of the central fringe. 
D, the distance from the slit to screen, lambda is the wavelength, and A is the size of the single slit. So we can actually calculate the width of the central fringe using this equation, and then all the other fringes are, don't have the two in it because they're half the width. And then this would allow us to sketch our double and diffraction gradients because they'd all be enclosed in this intensity pattern as well. So that's a single slit, and that's how I'm going to finish off this video. So I hope you found this useful in terms of explaining what's going on with the diffraction grating, how we can use those, and the effect of single slit interference on the other patterns. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please do feel free to ask. I'd happy to I'm happy to answer all of those. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video.